Hello everyone. A very good morning, afternoon, evening to all of you who are joining us from different parts of the globe for this session on evolution of applied recommender systems. My name is Dibanjana Banerjee and I'm a data scientist at Walmart Global Tech. And for the session today, I'm going to be your instructor along with my colleague, Sinduja Subramaniam, who's a staff data scientist at Walmart Global Tech. What we have planned for you today is a journey of recommender systems through the ages, starting from the 1990s when it was first incepted, all the way to the deep learning architecture that we see and know today. So without further ado, let's get started. The emerging technology of applied recommender systems started sometimes in the early 1990s when the visionaries back then understood that the world is changing from its physical or goods economy to information economy. And in future, companies would be selling information to its customers in exchange for revenue. So as the amount of information boomed up, it was imperative to match the right information to the right individual or vice versa. And the first industry to kickstart this was in fact the entertainment industry, wherein you know, users or readers were asked to rate a movie or a news article and in exchange, they were recommended a bunch of new movies or new articles by these recommender systems, okay? So this era was called the lens era, primarily because of the backend application of group lens, the backbone algorithm for which is known as collaborative filtering. Now, before we go on to collaborative filtering and venture into what it means, let's try and understand a few of the terms associated with it. The first of which is called user item interaction matrix. I'm going to use an example from the entertainment industry to explain what we mean by user item interaction matrix. Now, suppose we have a matrix over here. We have a couple of users over here. There's Angelina, Cho, Luna, and Parvati. Each row denotes the row for a user. Likewise, we have a couple of movies. There's Goodfellas, Pulp Fiction, Fight Club, Forrest Gump, and Braveheart. And each of the columns represent the movies. And a particular cell over here represents the rating given by the ith user to the jth movie. For example, Fight Club over here has a movie rating of 6 given by Angelina, whereas Fight Club has a movie rating of 8 given by Cho. Another example from the industry of retail would be the user item propensity matrix. And here, instead of the movies, we have items in the columns and the rows remain with users. And each of the cells here indicate the propensity or likelihood of a particular user purchasing a particular item. For example, point eight here means that Angelina has a propensity of purchasing furniture with a probability of about 80%, okay? Now you will see a lot of the cells over here are missing and that is okay because not all customers would be purchasing all items. In fact, at any given point of time, a customer would only have purchased a handful of items in the entire Walmart ecosystem. And one of the problems that we try to solve with this is try to come up with predictions for these missing cells. So let's look at one of these problems. For example, we have a user over here, Cho, and an item, Wallart. And Cho at present has not purchased Wallart, but we want to understand what is her propensity of purchasing Wallart in the future. This problem is called matrix completion, where we are starting with an incomplete user item matrix, and then we are trying to come up with predictions with each of, each of the predictions for each of the missing cells. Okay, so let's see how we do it. Before going on, it's important to start with a few notations. And for a moment, I want you to forget about the overall user item matrix and concentrate on the components. So we have a couple of users over here. There are four users, which I'm naming user one, two, three, four. And there are five items, which I'm naming item one, two, three, four, five. And the propensity Y, which are displayed in each of the cells is denoted by YIJ. 
so essentially y11 what this means is the propensity of user 1 that is angelina purchasing item 1 that is furniture in this case 0 0.8 likewise we have y35 which is the propensity of user 3 that is luna purchasing item 5 that is beauty in this case 0 0.9 all right so let's see now what we are trying to predict. We are trying to predict the propensity of the second user Cho to purchase the third item wall art, right? So in this case, it's going to be Y23. This is what we are trying to predict. With me so far? Great. All right. So let's move on to the next bit and try and understand how we go about this solution. Like I said, I want you to stop thinking about user item matrix for a while and concentrate on the components. And the first component we will concentrate on are the items. Here we have five items. There's furniture, loungewear, wall art, electronics and beauty. And let's assume with respect to each of these items, there are some inherent clusters which are there. We do not know where they are. We do not know how to get to them. But suppose these inherent clusters exist, but we do not have any information on as of now. So let's look at these clusters. There's home decor and both furniture and wall art belong to home decor and home decor only. There's self-care, loungewear and beauty both belong to self-care, but loungewear also belongs to apparel. So there's a soft clustering going on. And the third one, electronics, this solely belongs in ETS, okay? So based on these inherent clusters, we can actually have vector representations corresponding to the items, which we can call item embeddings. And in this case, we are going to call them propensity-based item profiles. So let's understand what these are. Each element in this particular item profile is corresponding to one of the inherent clusters. For example, furniture is give, represented by 1000. Zero, zero, zero. And what this means is furniture relies completely in home decor and does not tack to any of the other clusters. However, in loungewear, the first position corresponding to home decor and the third position corresponding to ETS are zero. That means loungewear does not relate to home decor or ETS. However, the second position corresponding to self-care and the fourth position corresponding to apparel are populated. And point three and point seven, what these would translate to is loungewear affiliates 30% to self-care and 70% to apparel. With me so far? Great. But for the purpose of collaborative filtering, such propensity-based item profiles would be unknown to us, at least at the beginning of the problem. Like I said, these clusterings are inherent, so they exist. But at this point of time, we will not have any information about these. Just like item profiles, we will also have user profiles. So in this case, we had four users. There was Angelina, Cho, Luna, and Parvati. And then we had the inherent clusters as, you, as usual. Based on these inherent clusters, just like item profiles, we can also come up with user profiles beta. And let's understand what these mean. Once again, uh, each element in a particular user profile corresponds to one of the inherent clusters. With Angelina, for example, the vector is 0 0.7, 0 0.2, 0, 0.0. What this means is Angelina has a propensity of 70% to purchase items from home decor and a propensity of 20% to purchase items from self-care. And the remaining two are zero. Now, it does not mean that this particular vector, the sum of this particular vector has to sum up to one. The reason is these inherent clusters are not exhaustive in nature. What we are seeing here might only be a part of the overall cluster mechanism. So none of these user profiles or item profiles for that matter need to sum up to one. All right. And like I said before, as for the purpose of collaborative filtering, the user profiles would also be unknown. So we have unknown user profiles. We have unknown item profiles. OK, so now let's take a step back and assume, assume, just assume that if the user profiles were available to us, that is, if beta were available to us, and in the end, what we are trying to estimate is y23, that is one of the propensities, it falls down to a linear regression problem. 
where this is the loss function and you can have a regularization constraint attached to it with respect to x. And if you're trying to minimize the whole thing with respect to x, what you have here is you're basically solving for x when y is regressed on beta. So this is basically the estimate of x given beta and the observational y's. Okay, and the estimate of y23, that is the propensity of the second user for the third item, would be given by the, the dot product of B2 transpose, that is the, the user profile of the second user, and the estimated item profile of the third user. So as long as we know the simple logic and the simple linear algebra associated with linear regression, we are good to go with it. However, um, this kind of uh, assumption is highly unrealistic. That is, you cannot assume that for a practical purpose, user profiles will indeed be given to you. And for most cases, you will have to work for it. So what to do when user profile or beta is actually not available? Well, let's take a step back again and look at the same equation again, just in a different light. Can you tell me what the difference is? Well, the only thing that I've changed here from the equation in the last slide and the equation over here is I have replaced my x with the j's. So the loss function remains the same. The regularization turns from in, uh, turns into a function of beta instead of x's because earlier I was solving for x given beta and here I'm solving for beta given x. However, the process for the two is exactly similar. In both cases, it's going to be very similar to solving a linear regression problem of y on x or y on beta. So since x and beta are interrelated, here's what we do in this scenario. We iterate. We start with a few initial values of beta and using the equation on the last slide, we come up with estimates of x. Then we use these estimates of x to recompute beta using this equation. And this goes on for a while in an iterative fashion where we try to compute x and beta until convergence. So there you have it. Now you know how to perform collaborative filtering on your own. Okay, so now let's look at the drawbacks of collaborative filtering. The first and foremost is the sparsity issue. So since at the back end we talked about collaborative filtering being very close to linear regression, you need enough response variates or why. That is, if your user item interaction matrix is sparse, it's going to be an issue. The second one is the cold start issue or the cold start problem. What I mean by that is if there's a recommender, um, if there's a user who is relatively new to the system and does not have historical propensity, it is very difficult to recommend to that user. Okay. The fifth one is actually also pretty interesting. And I guess a lot of you might have already guessed that uh, this iterative experience that I just talked about is by no means computationally inexpensive. So it can easily run into scalability issues. Now, all these drawbacks that I'm listing over here, it's not like they cannot be addressed. There are ways we can address them. There are ways we can curb them altogether. However, for this particular session, I won't have time to go into it. But what I can do is I can link you, uh, I can link a couple of references for you to go on um, and check out later. Okay, so moving on to the next one that is content based filtering. So here we will look at the same problem that is, we are trying to predict cho uh, chose purchase propensity for wall art. Okay. So here we have a couple of items, the same items in fact, we have furniture, loungewear, wall art, electronics and beauty. And with respect to each of these items, we have some related item attributes. Um, these item attributes uh, have to be related to the propensity, that is important, but these, these could be external to the problem. For example, the overall sales of the item, the add to cart rate, customer rating of the item, the content quality score of the item, and whether the item belongs in the home, apparel, ETS, or whatever department in Walmart. Now, the thing about content-based uh, filtering is these item profiles are in fact known to us. So based on these item attributes, I can create a vector representation for each of the items, just like we did in the earlier case. However, with collaborative filtering, these were not known to us. In content-based filtering, item profiles are explicitly known to us, but might be external to propensity. So let's understand what this means. 
furniture over here has this particular vector and once again each of the entries in the vector corresponding to each of the fields in the related attributes uh, so 1.2 million this stands for an overall sales of 1.2 million dollar 0.4 stands for a 40 percent add to cart rate 3.4 stands for an average customer rating of 3.4 out of 5 0.8 stands for an 80% item content quality score and home means furniture belongs to the home department in Walmart. Likewise for loungewear, we have an overall sales of $0.5 million, an add to cart rate of 20%, an average customer rating of 3.2 out of 5, an item content quality score of 70% and the fact that loungewear belongs to the apparel department in Walmart. Okay. And the good thing is for content-based filtering, these item profiles are available to us. So you may be thinking, is it important to have user profiles available too? Does it matter? Well, as it turns out, it does not. As long as we are trying to predict propensity and we have propensity or observational bias for some user item pairs and the item profiles are available, solving for beta reduces to linear regression problem. We are essentially trying to solve for beta when y is regressed on x. The estimate of beta given x is given by this particular arg mean and the estimate of y to 3, that is the propensity or the estimated propensity of the second user for the third item is given by the dot product of beta 2 transpose, that is the user profile for the second user and x3, that is the item profile for the third user. And mind you, item profiles in this case are known to us. Now on to a few drawbacks of content-based filtering. First, the external attributes or the item profiles may actually be difficult to obtain and are often domain dependent. Secondly, regression should involve feature selection. What I mean by that is, as long as you are taking item profiles based on external attributes, these attributes should somehow be related to your response variable, in this case, your propensity. The third one is regarding the cold start issue, which is very similar to collaborative filtering, so I won't go into it again. The fourth one, where I'm trying to say that the recommendations based on content-based filtering are um, limited, and they tend to stay in a safe bubble, let's try and understand what I mean by that. One of the answers that content-based filtering try to address is show me more of what I like. Essentially, if a customer has purchased wall art in the past, the recommender system is made to recommend items which the customer might be prone to buying, that is similar items to wall art. It could be any item from the home department, throw pillow, wall decor, rugs, furniture, or more of wall art. And the way we do this, or the way content-based filtering does this, is through item profiles. Given the customer has purchased wall art in the past, it's going to look for profiles similar to that of wall art in the item, in the item section. Likewise, if the customer has purchased loungewear in the past, it is likely to suggest profiles similar to loungewear, which could be more of loungewear or in this case, beauty. But if I wanted to diversify the customer profile, that is, even if the customer has purchased only loungewear or beauty products, that is mostly self-care driven, driven products in the past, I want to nudge the customer and recommend a few electronic or furniture items to him. I won't be able to do that with the help of content-based filtering. Okay, all right. So moving on to the next bit, which is the most important and probably the last module in classical recommender systems, that is the low rank matrix factorization. So based on whatever we have seen so far, it should be evident that the propensity matrix of the user item interaction matrix Y can be approximated by beta multiplied by X transpose, where beta is the user profile and X is the item profile. So according to the theory of matrix factorization and algebraically speaking, if we have a matrix Y, it can be broken down into a loadings matrix, which gives us the user profiles or user embeddings, and the factor matrix, which gives us the item profiles and, or item embedding. Okay, And each of these are low rank counterparts or low rank factorization of the bigger matrix. So algebraically, once again, this particular uh, cell that we were trying to obtain the previous exercise, right? So essentially, the cell um, that is situated in the 
second row and the third column, that is y23, will be given as a dot product of the second row of the loadings matrix and the third column of the factors matrix. Okay, so this is in fact what won the Netflix prize in uh, 2006 and is one of foundation foundational cornerstones of modern day classical recommender systems. Okay. The last thing that we have today, at least on the classical end, is the hybrid recommender systems. We have collaborative filtering based recommender systems, which primarily bases on interaction matrix. There's content based filtering, which is based on known item profiles and external attributes. There's knowledge based filtering uh, or knowledge based recommender systems, which primarily are driven by external information or surveys that we have, um, or prior knowledge that we might have gathered with respect to surveys. This may or may not involve data science driven techniques and hybrid recommender systems are the most evolved, which are an ensemble of two or more of the constituents. Now, does that make sense that hybrid recommender systems will always outperform the constituents? Well, that's not always true. And I'm going to leave it as an exercise to you to understand why that may not always be true. So uh, I will not have the time to actually go through this quiz uh, in the workshop itself. What I want you to do is I want you to take a screenshot of this and post the answers in the Q&A section where we can have a discussion. With that, I am going to hand over to Sindhuja for deep learning based recommender systems. Thank you, Devanshna. Hi, everyone. I'm Sindhuja Subramanyam. My role at Walmart Labs is all about tackling problems and solving challenges in and around personalization. It is so nice to see all of you enthusiastic about recommender systems. I'm excited to share information about deep neural networks, deep learning, and continue this workshop. In the limited time, this could be a lot of information to take in, but we have tried our best to summarize evolution of applied deep learning for all of you. Hopefully, this would be a good start, and of course, all the materials shared in this have their due credits in reference section. As a follow-up, I would recommend all of you to make use of these references for a deeper dive into each of the topics discussed as well. Let's begin with how it all started. Back in 1986, a team of researchers came up with a learning algorithm based on backpropagation for few layers. At that time, there was not really any hype about the algorithm. But around 1989, it was applied in recognizing handwritten letters. That was primarily where researchers saw some potential, but due to lack of big data, it was not as hot as it is right now. Around 2009, ImageNet was published, and from then on, there was exponential explosion of data, which paved the way for era of big data, followed up by a lot of researchers in industry applying deep learning techniques. For neural networks, which is sort of the basis of deep learning, we need millions of connections and thousands of nodes. Without enough data, this couldn't happen. So now pretty much every technology company processing big data is adapting to deep learning applications. And you can also uh, gauge the impact of this by looking at recent data conferences where there's significant occupation from this area. Neural networks are the key to making computers more like humans and automating the human brain's problem solving and creative capabilities. Let's take a look at what a neural network looks like. In essence, a neural network is a computer program that tries to simulate a way a human mind works, more specifically by simulating neurons themselves. The circles in this image are equivalent to artificial neurons that are stacked together and arranged in layers. The number of nodes in the input layer is equal to the number of features in the input data set. The simple neural network consists only of uh, one neuron and is called a perceptron. However, in the case of multilayer perceptrons, the output from the neurons in the previous layer serves as the input to the neurons of the preceding layer. If you take an example of image recognition, these layers work together to figure out what the neural network might be seeing in any given image it's shown. Um, each layer of neurons makes its own set of increasingly specific inferences about the contents of that image, which is the next, which is what the next layer builds upon to formulate a better guess at what the image shows. After being trained on a significantly large number of previously identified images, it eventually knows enough to recognize what a chair or table look like, and it could even draw one. A single layer perceptron can solve simple problems where data is linearly separable into n dimensions, where n is the number of features in the data set. However, in case of non-linearly separable data, the accuracy of single layer perceptron decreases significantly. Multi-layer perceptrons, on the other hand, can work efficiently with non-linearly separable data. An artificial neural network has an input layer, one or more hidden layers, and an output layer. This is shown in the image. Uh, depending on the number of hidden layers, we can identify the network as being simple or deep. Since this is a beginner intermediate session, I would like to touch upon the concepts of learning that might be crucial for you to even understand the applications. 
um of course uh, due to lack of time uh, it's not comprehensive and i'll keep this to a bare minimum uh, we have some references as prerequisites and have some references as a follow up to this workshop which i would highly recommend encourage and encourage beginners to go through this should help us get started though let's assume that uh, we are dealing with image output inputs so the input layer represents an image and uh, let's say the size of the image is 64 by 64 by 3 uh 3 because it corresponds to red blue and green values of the pixel so a neural net network executes in two phases feed forward and backward propagation uh during the feed forward phase uh, the values received in the input layer are multiplied with the weights and a bias is added to the summation of inputs and weights in order to avoid null values each neuron in the first hidden layer middle one you see here receives different values from the input layer depending on the weights and bias Neurons uh, also have an activation function that operate upon the value received from the input layer, and they can be of many types, like a sigmoid function or ReLU. Over here, we have only one hidden layer, but uh, let's say there are more than uh, that. Then the outputs from the first hidden layer neurons are then multiplied with the weights of the second hidden layer, and results are summed together and passed to the neurons of the preceding layers. This process continues until the outer layer is reached. The values then that are calculated at the outer layer are the actual outputs of the algorithm. you would have already noticed that because we have multiple neurons in one layer the computations are prefer preferably done in a matrix form as seen on the right side however the predicted output is not necessarily correct right away it can be wrong and we need to correct it the purpose of a learning algorithm is to make predictions that are as accurate as possible uh, to improve these predicted results the neural network will then go through a back propagation phase During back propagation the weights of different neurons are updated in a way that the difference between the desired and predicted output is as small as possible. In back propagation the error is calculated by quantifying the difference between the predicted output and the desired output. This difference is usually called the loss and the function used to calculate the difference is called the loss function. Loss functions can be of different types uh, for example mean squared error or cross entropy functions. Once the error is calculated the next step is to minimize that error. to do so partial derivative of the error function is calculated with respect to all the weights and biases this is called gradient descent the derivatives can be used to find the slope of the error function and if the slope is positive the values of the weights can be reduced or if the slope is negative the value of the weight can be increased this uh, reduces the overall error and the function that is used to reduce this error is called the optimization function this one cycle of feed forward and backward propagation is called one epoch and the process continues until convergence or a reasonable accuracy is achieved which is really dependent on your use case i know this this was a super quick walk through of the process but due to lack of time we have added references for you you can walk through this process in more detail using them and hopefully this helps us get started with the applications and provides you with an intuitive way of looking at the learning process Since we started with image-based inputs, um, I took the example of classifying images and doing image-based recommendations as the first application. Convolutional neural networks (CNNs) are the most important neural network models being used for image classification problems. The big idea behind CNNs is that a uh, local understanding of an image is good enough. Um, a CNN can be thought of as a features identifier, which each new layer being trained to determine more high-level features. using an image of a lamp as an example the first layer is only able to detect uh, curves or some lines while the next layer is able to detect a combination of curves as you go deeper crn is able to recognize the support the color or shade uh, parts of the lamp and finally the whole lamp in this diagram you can see how the complete image classification works our input is a training data set that consists of n images each labeled with one of the k different classes then we use the training set to train a classifier to learn what each class looks like in the end we evaluate the quality of the classifier by asking it to predict labels for a new set of images that it has never seen before we then compute the true labels of these images to the ones predicted by the classifier now you might have noticed uh, in this diagram for cnn that we have layers like pooling and convolution um, i have not yet introduced you to the concept of pooling and convolution that we see here so let's take a look at what that does and how that helps in learning and then revisit this architecture so the pooling layer and the convolution layer are operations that are applied to each of the input pixels mm, like i said the input pixels are the image pixels right uh so there are various types of pooling um, in this example um, i have an input data that is of size 4 into 4 um let's uh, think of it as an image uh, of 4 by 4 pixels uh, that you see on the bottom left 
um, in the pooling layer, we superimpose the two into two kernel on the input pixel and take the maximum if it is max pooling or go with the average if it is average pooling. That's just as simple as that, what is being you know depicted in this diagram. Um, now, why do we do that? Why do we like want a smaller matrix? Um, we do this because the pooling layer serves to progressively reduce the spatial size of the representation, to reduce the number of parameters and amount of computation in the network, and hence also to control overfitting. Um, on the other hand, the convolution layer uh, serves to detect uh, multiple patterns in multiple subregions in the input. Uh, consider a 5 into 5 image, a really scaled down version for understanding. Uh, CNN can efficiently scan it chunk by chunk. Uh, if you follow this diagram, you see that there's a 5 into 5 image and there's a 3 by 3 window. And this 3 by 3 window is sliding along the image, usually from like left to right and top to bottom, as shown. Uh, how quickly it slides is called its stride length. Uh, for example, here uh, the stride is of length 2, meaning the 3 into 3 sliding window moves by 2 pixels at a time until it spans the entire image. Um, and the convolution itself is a weighted sum of the pixel values of the image as the window slides along or across the whole image. Uh, if you if you look at that, it's basically just a dot product which I've calculated and put up on the top um, for you to uh, look at. Turns out uh, this convolution process throughout an image with a weight matrix produces another image of the same size depending on the convention. Uh, convolving is the process of applying a convolution itself. Uh, so typically CNN has multiple such convolution layers. Each convolution layer typically generates many alternate convolutions. So the weight matrix is a tensor of uh, 3 into 3 uh, by n where n is the number of convolutions. Uh, the beauty of convolution neural networks is that the number of parameters is independent of the size of the original image itself. You can run the same CNN on like a 5 into 5, uh, like a 50 into 50 image uh, for instance and the number of parameters won't uh, change in the convolution layer. The uh, convolution plus uh, pooling layers is where the images are recognized, uh, features are extracted, and the fully connected layers are where the images are classified into predefined classes. So we, here we have like two layers of uh, convolution and pooling. Uh, the practical benefit is that having uh, fewer parameters greatly re improves the time it takes to learn as well as reduces the amount of data required to train the model. Instead of a fully connected network of weights uh, from each pixel, a CNN has just enough weights to look at a small patch of the image. Uh, the intuition is that the exact location of the feature is less important than its rough location related to other features. Um, training the network requires uh, query, positive and negative images. A product image is an image of the product, uh, preferably against a white background with no other objects in the scene. Uh, the negative image is a product image of another product within the same product category. There are several different types of negative images. Uh, this includes in-class negative images, which teach the network to pay attention to low-level nuance differences like uh, material or texture. Uh, another type is out-of-class negative images, which train the network to pay attention to shapes and colors. Um, if you treat this as a product view, where you want to recommend similar products, for example, uh, here the LAMP product is out of stock, uh, then it it forms a recommendation of alternate products to display to the customer. Uh, you can also look at it as a pure search. Uh, for example, uh, in the left panel, there is a photo input that customer has fed in, from which objects of interest need to be extracted for identification. Then uh, we retrieve set of images from the catalog, which are similar to these objects of interest. This task is highly complex because the image object can be of a different size, orientation, or shot against different types of backgrounds or in varied lighting conditions. That makes this problem really challenging. Another popular and interesting application is item or customer embeddings and to vec models. Mm, word to vec is an example of that. Um, word to vec is actually a neural network technique, not actually deep, uh, to learn embeddings of words that has certain properties. Main thing we want the network to learn here are vector representation of words. It should be constructed in such a way that uh, they're closely related or uh, whenever we try to match, the synonyms of the word are matched. Um, as features of this algorithm, we have a context window uh, which takes into consideration a part of the phrase or few words where the middle word is a target word and all the words around it equal to the context window size as the context words. Let's say we take like the first three words in the phrase, uh, we try to predict the fourth word. We have a lot of text, uh, we can take this context window and slide it over all of our text. In this way, we can learn a model which is very good in predicting what word comes after um, arbitrary words in a phrase. Once we have learned this model, the last layer has learned for every word, representation of the word as big as the vocabulary with dimensionality of the input layer. Um, 
what we described just now was pretty much continuous bag of words which is a small neural network and it's one of the two versions we can do this in and the other one is skip gram uh, where we are inverting this problem given a word in the middle or the word in the end we are trying to predict the words around it but essentially they are more or less doing the same thing learning representations once we complete this the embeddings we learned are expected to have nice geometric properties um, how we can use this so variations of it for recommendations is uh, turns out a lot of um, natural language processing can be used in recommender systems without much modification. Um, for uh, example, uh, let's take the case of a customer who has purchased 10 products in Walmart.com. Uh, what we can do is uh, we can put the first four items that he or she purchased and try to predict the fifth item that he or she purchased. Then we can slide the window and take a uh, second to fifth item to predict the sixth item that he or she purchased. We can do this exercise over all the items that customers have purchased. Uh, in this way, we can learn dense representation of these items. Once we have learned them, we can use them in a lot of tasks. Uh, maybe for computing similarity between items directly or in an other algorithms where they can be used as features or inputs. There are so many variations of this algorithm, doc 2 egg, prod 2 egg, uh, back prod 2 egg, etc. And this model is also extended to include user profiles and user prod 2 egg for user embeddings for user to product predictions. Um, <clears throat> Now, um, to give you some, you know, examples, um, consider a database of customer orders in which each order typically includes multiple products. Um, over here, you can see a depiction of that. We can interpret each order as a sentence and each product as a word and apply word to vec model to learn product embeddings. This type of model is known as item to vec. <clears throat> this simple approach is known to uh, produce useful product embeddings that capture purchasing or browsing patterns and reveal the affinity between products that are perceived or used in similar ways by customers. Um, the beauty of what to work approach is that the basic solution described in the previous section can be naturally extended in many ways to incorporate multiple heterogeneous data sources. Uh, for example, um, here uh, one can incorporate content data by replacing the product IDs with product attributes. Uh, in this way, orders or web sessions can be represented as flat sequence of product attributes and then attribute embeddings can be learned. This approach efficiently blends behavioral data with product data, capturing both purchase patterns and attribute based product similarities. The obtained attribute embeddings can be rolled up into product embeddings and then session embeddings and finally customer embeddings. This rolling up process can usually be done through simple averaging. Uh, for example, a product embedding is the average of embeddings of all of its attributes. Although the item to vec models described just now can produce customer embeddings using roll ups, uh, this is not the only approach. Another natural solution is to use doc to vec instead of word to vec. Uh, word to vec learns from plain sequences of tokens and uses notion of a sentence only to reset the learning context. It doesn't support any um, hierarchical relationships such as uh, product order customer. Uh, this is clearly a limitation because events in a customer journey depend not only on global event patterns but also on customer identities. In the NLP world, a equivalent, an equivalent problem is learning sentence embeddings as opposed to word embeddings. The standard solution for this problem is doc 2 which uh, directly generates sentence embeddings. The difference between these two approaches is that word 2 is based on the idea that word representation should be good enough to predict surrounding words. Uh, for example, the cat sat on the predicts mat. This makes sense for product representations. Um, doc 2 is based on the idea that a sentence, uh, that is a document, uh, representation should be good enough to predict words in the sentence. Uh, for example, uh, the most important thing may be the best prediction on average, but the most important feature may be the best prediction for a text on machine learning. Uh, similarly, a good product embedding should predict future events for this customer. Customer embeddings obtained by averaging the product embeddings associated with the customer interaction history do not necessarily achieve this goal. Another popular method. Session based uh, recommendations with recurrent neural networks. Um, session is when a customer is buying something, the sequence of events that he or she performs. For example, uh, clicks leading to a purchase. Um, here, let's say the customer does three clicks before purchasing the chair on the bottom left. Sessions could be like short, short sessions or long sessions. Uh, but we can clearly see here, even from this example, that there's some order or sequence here that we can still use to do recommendations. Um, Enter recurrent neural networks, which are actually deep learning methods to model sequences of data used in text, NLP, audio, etc. Uh, the idea is that the units in recurrent neural networks have some kind of inner state. Here, the inner state is the function of the input and previous state of the network. So what this means is that when the data comes into the network, this hidden state is also summarizing all the data or at least the recent data that it has seen. We can think of this hidden state as a summary of current and past data that it has seen. 
the output of this network is just a function of this hidden state. That makes these networks uh, good in modeling sequential data and to recognize patterns in them. Variations of uh, recurrent neural networks like gated recurrent unit, LSTM, GRU for rec are used for recommendations. Um, to add to that, when you want to add personalization and want to consider logged in users, uh, that is users with past sessions and not only anonymous ones with current session events tracked, we can either concatenate sessions to create really long sessions or uh, use hierarchical recurrent neural networks. Add one more popular class of methods to this session uh, because Tepanjana covered collaborative filtering in detail. I want to check in on the same with the deep learning equivalent. So the method I want to go over next is deep collaborative filtering. The main components here are the autoencoders, which are basically deep neural networks. They predict the output using the input passing through a narrow hidden layer. There is an encoder component here, which takes the input and projects it to a lower dimensional space. And there is a decoder, which takes this lower dimensional representation and tries to decode it to the original data set. The task is basically to reconstruct the input at the output. Uh, now we can, you know, slightly corrupt the input and with it try to predict the output. In an e-commerce setting, let's say your customer purchased 10 items. How do we use this information to recommend new products? We can take those 10 items, remove one item and set that as input and at the output, try to reconstruct all the 10 items purchased. In this way, autoencoder learns the relationship between different items purchased. Because many people have similar tastes, these patterns are expected to repeat. The autoencoder learns these sort of patterns and then we can use the learning process to recommend other items that the autoencoder recommends. Again, to add personalization, there are variations to this algorithm, uh, like MVDNN, where the user and item features are embedded into lower dimensional space. And we can compute similarity between these two embeddings based on whether this user and item have ever interacted with each other. Um, of course, there are uh, many more forms of deep learning that needs to be explored. Some of the prominent ones are listed here. Unfortunately, we can't cover all of them in this session due to lack of time, but we've added references for the same. Um, Lastly, I would like to conclude by talking about some prominent strengths and weaknesses of deep learning. Uh, we saw a lot of applications of it. Let's take a look at the strengths and weaknesses as well. Contrary to linear models, deep neural networks are capable of modeling the non-linearity in data with non-linear activation functions such as ReLU, Sigmoid, TanH, etc. This property makes it possible to capture the complex and intricate user item interaction patterns. Um, deep neural networks are efficient in learning the underlying explanatory factors and useful representation from input data. They help in reducing the efforts in handcrafted feature design and enable recommendation models to include heterogeneous content information such as text, images, audio, and even video. Um, deep neural networks have shown promising results on a number of sequential modeling tasks such as machine translation, natural language understanding, speech recognition, chatbots, and many others. RNN and CNN play critical roles in these tasks. Are there really any drawbacks or limitations with using deep learning for recommendation? Uh, yes, um, despite its success, deep learning is well known to behave as black box. Providing explainable predictions seems to be a really challenging task. However, this concern has been eased with the advent of neural attention models and have paved the way for deep neural models with improved interpretability. A second possible limitation is that deep learning is known to be data hungry in the sense that it requires sufficient data in order to fully support its rich parameterization. However, as compared with other domains such as language or vision in which labeled data is scarce, it is relatively easy to garner a significant amount of data within the context of recommender systems research. Million or billion scale data sets are commonplace, not only in industry, but also released as academic data sets. A third well-established argument against deep learning is the need for extensive hyperparameter tuning However, uh, note that hyperparameter tuning is not an exclusive problem of deep learning, but machine learning in general. Uh, that's all from our side today. Uh, we are open to follow up questions and have provided our email address for reference. Um, before dropping off, uh, we would like to sincerely thank uh, Srujana and Margo for giving us this opportunity. This is a great initiative to bring in more people into the field of data science. Uh, so thank you, Srujana and Margo. Uh, thanks a lot, everyone. Uh -huh.